Hi, this is your Supreme Bhartiya and we are here at Open Source Summit in Dublin. Today we have with us once again, Ibrahim Haddad, VP of Strategic Programs at the Lynx Foundation. Ibrahim, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, welcome to Open Source Summit, the EU edition. Yeah, we have been like, it's been years since we sat down in the in-person. We have been doing a lot remotely, so it's good to uh, do these things in person again, which also means it's good to see these events in person. Uh, so you have, of course, you know, it's been third or fourth day. I don't know which day it is today, uh, which is funny, but right, because sometimes the day starts before uh, the events, you know, there are other uh, co-hosted events as well. Uh, what kind of crowd are you seeing now as compared to early days, especially from the perspective, how many people are using open source versus they understand how open source work? Because we'll be talking about open source program office also, which also means to understand, you know, the companies, how very well they understand. So talk about the crowd you have seen here. Sure. So I think it's uh, quite interesting uh, because of a couple of reasons, the whole situation. I mean, first, uh, if we look at the OSPO survey from the uh, To Do Group, I think it's foundation, year over year, I think they started doing the survey in 2018. So we have 2018 data, 2019, 2020, 2021, and now they're in their 2022 uh, survey season. If you look at all this data, it's always positive trending for open source, meaning more companies are establishing open source program offices, more companies are aware of the benefits of open source, there's more adoption and there's more contribution. And this is very much consistent with the data that we see day in and day out working really with dozens and hundreds of organizations, whether it's on the cloud computing uh, arena, whether it's on AI or uh, many other tech technology verticals across the Linux Foundation. So today it's really uh, increased adoption than in the year before and in the, in the previous year it's increased consumption and increased contribution to open source. So it's really an impressive increase across the board uh, in all facets related to open source software. Right. Also, when we look at the crowd at the Open Source Summit, of course, there are people who do, you know, understand, consume or use open source or contribute back to open source. Let's look at outside of the Open Source Summit or even outside of the open source uh, circle. Uh, of course, a lot of efforts are going, uh, are being done by the Linux Foundation itself, and there are other efforts going on. But what kind of trends here? I mean, you did touch upon that, but I just want to go into deeper that we are talking about open source program office a lot these days. The irony is that a lot of companies, they are using open source without realizing it which also means that, uh, first of all, they actually do not even know how to properly use. Consuming is different than using, and then how also become part of the community to give back, because sometimes giving back seems to them like giving something away, but the fact is, it's an ecosystem, you don't give anything back, you know, you just make you know, things better for yourself. So, so talk about, you know, what kind of trends are you seeing in the market where people, companies are actually understanding, or you're still kind of, feel that they still need education about it? So definitely on the education front, it's kind of consistent. You know, the more education you inject and put on in the market, then there's more awareness and then there's more demand on open source in terms of pull and then there's more demand on the training and so on. Uh, but kind of to take a step back, typically when you look at any given organization, kind of um, request and, and use of open source, it's either bottom up, meaning developers, uh, seeing some components, libraries, frameworks, different platforms that are beneficial to whatever they're building uh, in their stack, whether it's a service or, or, or a product, they go and developers kind of download the code, use it, try it out, um, get convinced that this is kind of from a functionality perspective, it fits the need and they start using it. So it's kind of bottom up from engineering all the way up. Or it can be the other way around, meaning an executive that realizes a CTO or VP of product or engineering, they realize that, hey, you know, there's this platform or library that's critical to, to what uh, we're building and it's open source and they direct their team to go and use it. And the really interesting trend is this is all great, but at some point when you have a lot of use within uh, your organization and, and consumption and different pockets contribute to open source, to be really highly efficient and to get the best ROI on your open source shoes, you need to have a body that coordinates all these efforts. And this is what organizations today call it OSPO, short for Open Source Program Office. It's basically a program office that manages open source within an organization and it is responsible for the use, contribution, 
compliance and community aspects of interacting with open source. And today, if you look at technology companies, like pretty much every single one of them has an open source program offices. And uh, I personally created a couple of them and I managed. And you know, my last job at Samsung Research was um, as the uh, leader and basically the founder of the open source program office. And um, I spent six years doing this. So there are um, a lot of organizations out there doing this. And it's even outside of technology. I mean, you can be in the transport business, in the uh, healthcare business, and within governments, a lot of governments are actually establishing units uh, whose whole purpose is to uh, manage the open source use within the government offices. Uh, so this is really a, a very interesting trend. We've been watching it for a couple of years, but now it's been extremely strong in terms of uh, companies actually executing on this. And in the past uh, few months, we've published two ebooks at the Linux Foundation. Uh, one is called Enterprise Open Source, and this looks at best practices for organizations using open source software and contributing to it. And the second one is um, in relation to OSPOs. Uh, what are the roles and responsibility of an OSPO and how you set up an OSPO? And a lot of our interactions with really hundreds of companies across the next foundation, we realized back to your first point that there's a lot of need for education. You know, people are looking for practical guidance. I mean, it's all nice to sit to a motivational um, presentation about the need to have such an effort happening within the organization. And it's a completely different thing to have kind of a guideline of a template telling you, here's the 10 things you can practically do to help your organization. And we really focus on the practical aspects of building multiple programs, building efficiencies in using and contributing to open source. If you look at the company, of course, they are big companies. And they, they are understanding the importance of open source, and they do have open source program offices. Uh, but then there are a lot of you know companies who are still trying to you know get into that bandwagon. Another set of challenges are new companies which are coming up. The problem with those companies is they don't have uh, either resources to have a dedicated program office. CEO, CTO, that's you know f whole team is five or six people, but they are building some amazing technologies. So which which of these two you know, buckets you see more challenging and more important to address? Um, your statement is true, and you know, definitely I, I agree that you know, a lot of the large companies are well established. I mean, if you look at the early adopters of open source, like IBM in year 2000, we are going to invest $1 billion in Linux. That was at a time where most companies didn't know what is Linux, right? So you have like the Google, the Facebook, the Microsoft, and all these large companies that are extremely well established and they realize the benefits of using and contributing and building communities around these technologies. Um, and then you have a lot of these smaller companies that really are, in terms of size, they don't have the resources to have an OSPO program office. So in that setup, it's really a virtual OSPO, meaning you, know, you don't have a dedicated uh, swap mail or Ibrahim, whose job is to focus on this. However, the responsibilities of managing the intake and the contributions are spread across a number of individuals. And this model is well documented in, in the recent uh, free ebook that we published, where we say there's not a single model that fits every company. Every company is different, they operate in a different vertical, they have different constraints. So there are maybe seven, eight different models in which you can set up an OSPO. As for kind of uh, the middle intersection, which you call the, you know, the cost model, um, I, I'm not a big fan of this model personally. Uh, this is, again, my personal opinion, not anything uh, you know, in relation to my current or any previous employers. I think you know, companies in that space are kind of struggling in monetizing how their products that are fully based on open source, and they're trying to solve the monetization problem by playing around with the licensing. And I don't think this is kind of the right way of addressing the problem. It's really kind of a business problem and not a licensing problem. There are, of course, a lot of companies that succeeded extremely well with open source. So it's not kind of an open source licensing problem. It's really a monetization problem. So I tend to focus my time on helping companies, you know, on these small startup companies, especially in the field of AI and data, where I'm operating at the next foundation in better understanding their ecosystem and better figuring out how to build their their uh, software and you know their contributions and build the community. As for the larger programs, uh, you know, at these large massive companies that are, for instance, you know, 
platinum numbers at NX Foundation, I try to work with them on the scaling issues. You know, how we can scale and have our offices and our open software, open source software investment scale to support, you know, the 70,000 employees we have. Um, so it's kind of a spectrum of um, activities and it's, it's um, super interesting and very engaging really across all levels. Right. You brought a very interesting point, which is about uh, companies are trying to uh, solve a business problem through licenses uh, and sometimes they point at the cloud providers because you know what uh, you, they can take my software offer as a service and I cannot compete at that scale but if you look at the just the Linux space desktop Linux uh, Ubuntu how many derivatives are there hundreds of derivatives are there for Ubuntu Fedora SUSE has their own derivatives but then you know it's not you know so this is not a new problem this problem has I mean that's the whole beauty of open source you can for the code and you can do whatever you want to do but if you're really good at your job your company will succeed in offering support and everything else so uh, looking at trying to use license to solve a business problem is kind of you know against the whole idea of open source because to me open source is more about collaborating it's not about code that much it's more about getting people to collaborate on something and when you compromise on that you kind of also lose the trust and faith you know, you release a product and suddenly you change the license next day because you're like, hey, we cannot compete in the market, which is actually bad, you know, so, but this is happening a lot these days. So you have been in this space for so long. Are you concerned about this problem or you think that over a period of time, things will settle down and people will realize that, no, the right way to approach is open core, or open source model? Um, very interesting. And actually, there's a lot to unpack in your, <laughs> in your uh, statement there. So I think like any other marketplaces, open source software and the ecosystem is the marketplace. Um, so from, from my perspective, coming to enter the open source ecosystem as a consumer of open source software, you know, you're relying on others to provide you uh, software. Now that software is free, meaning you don't have to pay license and fee for it. But of course, there are different responsibilities for, that you have to do and they're very simple and very similar to proprietary software. You still need to comply with the licenses, whether you're getting commercial license or not license. You still need to do QA, QA testing. You still need to do integration and, you know, and everything that's very similar to relying on uh, proprietary technologies. And like any other marketplace, when you look at any given technology sector, there are a lot of competing projects. So in my domain, AI and data, if you're looking for a deep learning uh, framework, there are probably around 15 of them competing in the marketplace. And eventually, they will filter down to two or three. Uh, and that applies to a lot of technologies. Um, so when it comes to kind of the licensing, um, you know, and by the way, your dimension of the Linux text, I think 2023 will be the best year. And this is kind of an ongoing um, a joke because, you know, to take it as an example, the definition of a desktop has really changed over the years. I mean, I spend more time on my phone than I actually do on my laptop, but most of the phones today, you know, they're running Android and that's Linux by definition. So we are on the Linux desktop, whether we realize it or not, in, in a sense. Um, and with respect to the uh, licensing, this is kind of quite a challenge. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I believe this is a business model um, a challenge. Uh, there are a lot of companies who, who succeeded. And coming in and changing, kind of taking in an open source license and changing a couple sentences of it, I mean, this, this is not a trust inviting environment to be in. Uh, that's first. And also it makes it very, kind of challenging from a compliance perspective because, um, you know, our SCA tool, you know, software compliance, uh, you know, software scanners that tells you the software is under this license. Um, are they able to detect these really small nuances in a modified Apache license, for instance, right? So there are a lot of different challenges. Um, and I don't think this is something that positive in the marketplace. And let the marketplace decide, you know, if, if you're happy with that, then go for it. I mean, there are no restrictions. I mean, if you're a company, you realize that this is what it is and you're happy with it, absolutely. And if you don't like that, there are many other alternatives. And eventually things will filter, filter down kind of a winner and you know, not so much a winner. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I prefer to leave it kind of to the market. And in that sense, the market are the adoptees of open source. Let them decide what they want 
what they're more comfortable with, and everybody else will adjust. And we see that on project levels where a project is adopted and all the other three or four competing projects, they're not necessarily a failure. I mean, they contributed a lot of code, they trained a lot of people on that technology, and they served a purpose. And all the contributors migrate to doing other innovative stuff. And the game of the game, the name of the game is innovation. How do you kind of outpace the cloud provider? How, you know, you just need to stay one step ahead of the way. What advice do you have for companies who are still at the step where they are either thinking about, you know, having an open source program office at a very early stage? What tips you have for them so they approach it in the right way? You know, if you go back 20 years, and I, I was actually with Linux Foundation from day one. I mean, I was in the first iteration, it was called Open Source Development Labs, before it merged with the Free Software Foundation. And, uh, a free software group and then rebranded into Linux Foundation. And at that time, we were working to improve Linux uh, for telecom deployment. So we needed to improve Linux from a serviceability perspective, performance, and security, and many other aspects to make it carrier grade. You know. And at that time, the telecom industry thought they were a very special industry, they're regulated, they're, they have government oversight, and, and so on. And over the years, you know, you had the telecom industry, then you had uh, multiple industries that followed, then you had the automotive industry that is now, you know, today you can go and buy multiple car brands and their infotainment system is Linux and based on Linux and open source software to about 85%. And today, as you mentioned earlier, the banking sector, which they think they're super special because they're, you know, they're finance and they're regulated and so on, and eventually, everybody is using and adopting. And I think it's a matter of time. Um, and that matter of time depends really a lot on um, your ability to understand as an organization that there are multiple ways to create software. One of them is created by yourself and manage it and you know, get it through suppliers. And the other way is to collaborate with others and use that massive investment in software as external R&D. So you have your internal R&D, and then you can go to other proprietary companies and kind of commission software, and that's also internal R&D. But there is also this multi-billion dollar collaboration aspect that's producing tons of software that are available for use and customization. And it's really a matter of understanding the ecosystem, understanding the risks from their perspective, uh, understanding the obligations, and understanding you know, how can we deploy that software, how can we maintain it, how can we work with uh, the community on it, and really a lot of education, back to your initial point. There's education at the engineering level, there's education at the management, and there's a lot of education at the executive level as well. So all of these together kind of are factors in, to play, but eventually I think even the most conservative companies that, you know, they were like believing that open source software is evil are today are one of the largest adoptees and largest contributors to open source. So they got to that in relatively short time uh, with really strong leadership and understanding of the ecosystem. And so it, other companies may take longer, other may take uh, shorter time, but eventually I think everybody's there. And the point to that is you know, a lot of companies today have anywhere between like 20 to 80% of their internal stacks powered by open source. So, you know, you cannot ignore that. Ibrahim, once again, thank you so much for sitting down with me and talk about, you know, uh, of course, the importance of open source and how folks can actually embrace open source practices within their organization through open source program offices. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Swapin. I think uh, one note just before I drop out, I would like to mention to anyone and everyone listening to, to this video recording that we have a ton of free resources available at the Linux Foundation about enterprise open source, about getting started with open source program offices, about license compliance. We also have a free training available. Uh, so I would really encourage you to go to our website and discover what kind of content and education that is available for you and it's all free and use it to your benefit.